All right, so this session's on uh, security modules and Node.js. Uh, and uh, I want to just give a brief introduction to the topic. Uh, can you all hear me okay? Is that all right? Is it back? Good. Uh, a brief introduction and then uh, hopefully a discussion. If people are interested, have thoughts, uh, if we've got any security experts here, would you please poke holes in, in, in what we're suggesting? Uh, that would be ideal. Uh, yeah, so uh, what this is, is if, if you, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is uh, Guy Bedford, uh, and I've been involved quite a bit in the Node Modules Working Group. Um, I should probably set up the Zoom chat so we can actually get um, participants. Sorry. Um, do you know what the, the meeting is for this? Yeah. 381. Three, uh, 381. 381. Double six. Double six. Eight six four two. Eight six four two. Yeah. Certainly planning advance. Do not connect. Do not connect audio. Yeah, yeah because audio is coming from here. Yeah, otherwise you have feedback. There you go. Yeah. Great. Okay. So we should be live. Uh, all right. Uh, can you share your screen through the, the Zoom? Share In the center. Yeah. Share. Got it. Okay, great. Yeah, good. So uh, for those of us who are just joining us online, um, I was just saying that working on the integration of uh, ES modules in Node.js uh, has quite a few touch points with the security of Node.js. So as, as we shift to ES modules and all the decisions we're making around ES modules are affecting the security of Node.js in future. Uh, and the other thing is that uh, WebAssembly has its own security models, uh, which as we integrate WebAssembly into Node also affect Node.js. So Node.js is sort of surrounded by a lot of interesting things going on at the moment. Uh, and in particular, security is a huge area. There is uh, so much that can be discussed. The problem that I'm focusing on here is very specifically the problem of running untrusted code from Node modules uh, and, and thinking about that and, and uh, if there are things that we can do about that. Uh, and this is all very, very much long-term thinking. So I'm not suggesting changing Node today much. Uh, I'm suggesting uh, just thinking about the longer term of the project and the longer term security positioning of the project. And if there's small, small tweaks we can do today and think about today to sort of plan for the future. Uh, in particular, I have a PR up. And this is actually what started the motivation for the session was um, a, a pull request to remove global.process, which is currently available in all modules but just for ES modules. And uh, currently, uh, Mateo is, is the block on that. So this, this entire session is to get Mateo to push that. Yeah. Thank you, Mateo. Uh, the inspiration here is almost entirely from uh, the uh, SES project, Secure ECMAScript project. Uh, and this is the problem of uh, and they've been tackling running secure third-party JavaScripts without security risks. So that everything I'm talking about, you can basically get exactly the same things from this talk that Mark Miller gave to TC39, uh, called Extremely Modular Distributed JavaScript. Uh, and I would strongly recommend taking down that YouTube uh, link and watching it because it's, it's a very interesting talk about this topic. Uh, and the, one of the key insights there is that JavaScript is very, very close to having some very, very strong security properties. It has no security properties right now, but it's very close to having some incredibly strong security properties. And um, uh, so the, there, there are some ways we can maybe nudge it in those directions. And the other thing about it is it's, uh, Mark Miller mentions it as being uh, surprising <coughs> in comparison to uh, other languages that you'd consider maybe technically superior. Uh, so this is the example of what we're looking at, uh, the type of attacks that are possible. Uh, this was an example earlier in the year where you've got a deep dependency of a dependency of a dependency, 
of a, of a widely installed package that maybe isn't maintained that well, uh, someone ends up maintaining it or getting, it getting the rights to that pack, to publish for that package. And in this case, it was the get cookies package and they were able to publish a backdoor into the node modules. And then anyone who's running upgrades of their dependencies without a lock file is potentially getting this backdoor. And uh, because it was a cookie parser, it could actually take commands uh, that would allow um, remote executions and things like that. Uh, so you've gone from not knowing that you were using this package and this person had access to your application uh, to them having full read access and being able to have full control and the ability to do anything they want. Um, and this is the model for a security talk, is like scare people about the problems and then, then dive into the solutions. Um, right, so the, the threat scenario is um, you, you have all these maintainers you depend on at any, any given time, someone could get access to one of them, push out a patch, uh, you install the patch without knowing it, and now you've, uh, you've been compromised. Uh, and because the, the security model of Node.js is uh, so permissive, any package can do anything. Uh, that cookie parser has full root access to the file system, so the maintainer of that cookie parser can, can push up code. Um, and then what happens is when this gets discovered, we have a, the security process that kicks in, and we've made uh, incredible strides in, in getting to a position where security audits are now completely widespread, and that's amazing how, how that process has been has been built. Uh, it's uh, it means that there's a very very short window before your uh, security gets uh, vulnerability gets discovered. Um, but the problem with with security auditing is it can only um, deal with uh, security vulnerabilities that are known about. And there is still that, that case where what about the, the sort of maintainer that's, that's been um, uh, compromised and there's that still small, that, that small window of time where they're, they're able to push up uh, damaging code and there's nothing you can really do about that. Um, and we're especially vulnerable because in the Node.js ecosystem, we depend on a lot of maintainers and it's, it's not going away. We're, you know, it's, it's growing over time, the amount of third party code we're using and we update incredibly fast as well. And with tools like Dependabox, you're, you're updating patches all the time. And that's great because on the other hand, you're, you're patching vulnerabilities that are being discovered, but it also means it's very easy to very quickly have uh, one of those maintainers you don't even know about, I haven't been following, uh, for them to just push up something that's malicious, for it to propagate very fast uh, before it's eventually caught and uh, mitigated. So it's this kind of, um, it's, it's this node modules time bomb of, of all of this, these vulnerabilities out there. Um, so I'll try and stop talking on too much about it now. Uh, but the idea is can we not somehow restrict, restrict those permissions so that it's not as, as bad? Um, um, there is uh, install scripts as well that you're not listing. Thank you. That that makes things hundred times worse as yes. well. Yes, uh, that was yes. So we should stop install scripts, and we should just run install scripts that um, need to build binaries and can do it in ways that don't attack. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Sorry, I just want to. No, no, it, it's it's worse than open saying. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> if if you um, if you try and speak to anyone about securing JavaScript or securing JavaScript as it works today. Uh, they'll very quickly, uh, the, the general assumption is that's just not possible because that's not how JavaScript works. The language has too many uh, security holes and we can't patch them. Uh, and the only security model for JavaScript is uh, per process isolation, per process sandboxing, that's what the browser does, that's what the V8 Chrome uh, engines do, and that's the only uh, security model. Uh, and to try and fix individual things like that PR that I've got up to remove the global dot process, you just, it's one small leak of, of a huge problem. Uh, so don't even bother. And, and that's before you even get into all this meltdown specter stuff where we have these uh, CPU hacks where um, even if you plug all those same process issues, it's still possible for uh, there to be same process vulnerabilities in the CPU itself. 
So once we solve the language, we've still got the, the problems of the, the CPU architectures. Um, so the, the, the counter counter argument is Node.js is not a browser. We shouldn't take our security advice from the browser environments. Uh, Node.js has very different uh, security properties. Um, and it's really not an option for us in Node.js to adopt uh, sandboxing of Node modules. The way that uh, we've, uh, we've written our code sharing in the language, uh, if we just sort of bolt on uh, some, some kind of sandboxing around that, it, it's, it's going to break a lot of features and the way that things already behave is they expect to be able to share the same bindings and the same function instances. Uh, so it's, it's not necessarily something we can just add on. Uh, so then is the question is, well, are we just left with security auditing? Uh, and we kind of have this process where uh, we know that any malicious maintainer could come in or socially engineer their way into a project or uh, steal the um, private keys of a maintainer. And uh, when that happens, it's just kind of a, a process where we all have to very quickly respond to that and that's just the way things are. And we just sort of accept this kind of uh, sacrifice every now and then that a few people are gonna get hacked from time to time and that's just the way things are. Um, and the, the, so the, the response to those arguments about trying to get perfect security is what can we do to mitigate those risks? So to reduce those risks, not perfectly solve them, not create an ecosystem where everything is perfectly secure, but what can we do to uh, make sure that as much as possible, um, we reduce that risk, which right now is quite high because any of the hundreds of maintainers that have access to my app can get full root access to my server. Um, so it's not a black and white issue. Uh, there will always be an attack surface. At minimum, you can be hacked. Uh, so if you think of this critical attack probability as something like how many maintainers have published access to your upgrade cards uh, times the average security standards of those maintainers. So do they use two-factor authentication? How susceptible are they to uh, spoofing or other types of hacking attacks? Uh, ideally, NPM by default would use 2FA, and I don't know if it already does, but that's, that's it. that would be a huge one to reduce this overall probability. And then the third thing that factors into this probability is that... Um, one thing that you might want to, to reach to NPM, and I don't know if that might be a hack, is uh, as part of the install data from the registry gives us the information that that published was published as 2FA enabled. And that is, that's probably valuable in this context. Sorry, came out of my head. Oh, that's, a, that's a very good point that you could have some kind of like uh, upgrade double dash secure. Uh, that you know, you can only so essentially you can check what are, can okay. be your uh, attack points. Uh, essentially, it's not a solution, but at least you know, you have data to, to measure that. And right now we don't. So, so you could say I only want to get patch updates from yeah, or, or non, or non, or non, zero. Yeah, I, I yes. want to manually update them. So that's a, that's a great and check manually. Because that, that way you can drive the two of a adoption as a user, yes. as opposed to expecting it to be some kind of yes. global thing that can be forced on all maintainers. Yeah. Okay, that's a great point. Uh, yeah, and then the third factor that that comes into this attack probability is if that maintainer does get hacked, and we know that they're on, uh, they're able to upgrade our packages. Uh, how capable are those maintainers, even if they wanted to, to, uh, to get access to our, to our systems? And at the moment, that's a one. So any maintainer gets full access. Uh, the question is, can we possibly think of a, of a way or an ecosystem in future where we could reduce that down so that uh, it's, it's averages less than one? Uh, and, and that's what we can mitigate. So, if we can just start reducing that capability over time and reduce the, the permissions that we give, uh, we could possibly start to mitigate this overall probability. Well, also, um, and then the other thing is we don't want to just reduce this probability by reducing the number of maintainers our apps rely on. We don't want to retreat into some kind of Ludditism where we think now we open source is insecure, we're just going to rely on our own company code or something like that. We want to encourage these healthy ecosystems where we can safely share code. Um, and so if we can focus on these 
these other two, then we can compensate uh, for, the, for the security risk. So I'm just going to take a step back and speak about the security model a little bit in WebAssembly. Uh, here is an example of uh, running uh, WebAssembly through uh, ES modules in Node.js today. Uh, that main should probably be a main.mjs, uh, or I could have a package JSON with a type module in the local folder. Uh, and in this example, I'm loading, say, uh, a, uh, a JavaScript parser that's in a third party module that I've installed, and I'm, I'm loading it from a WASM file. So I'm, I'm loading its memory, which is just a buffer and a pass function. And at the bottom there, I am uh, running the passes. So I'm, say, writing a string into the, into the buffer and then passing it and getting a pointer to the data structure and memory or something. It's, it's a very rudimentary and bad example, just showing the, the sort of bare minimum WebAssembly interfaces we have today. Um, but what this demonstrates is the security model where we could have, for example, and it's the two, the two factors of the security model. So the one thing is uh, having information be compromised. So say, for example, we've got some information. We don't want that third party module to be able to discover uh, the highly coveted shrug emoji. Uh, and then we also have a function here that we don't want to be run by, uh, by our third party module. So it, it, this function represents a capability that um, the nuclear launch function, uh, where you don't want the third party code to be able to call that function. So do we know that we can safely load this third party code, this third party WebAssembly code, without either exposing the secrets or exposing the ability to call these protected functions? Uh, here is what might be inside that Web WebAssembly module. It defines its memory, it defines its pass function, and then it exports them. And the amazing thing about WebAssembly is if we know that that module has no imports, so if we know for a fact that this WebAssembly module itself isn't able to import uh, anything else from our file system or, or the module system, then we don't care what code is in this parsing function. Uh, it could be downloaded from the like, dodgiest side of the internet. It doesn't matter what's in that function because it won't have access to, uh, it won't be able to get access to the secret information or the, the function capabilities we have in our other module. And so WebAssembly is a secure sandbox down to the imports that is given. And uh, if we can control which imports are available, then we can run unknown third-party WebAssembly code on the same process with zero risk. And uh, even with a Meltdown Inspector, uh, we don't have that problem either because Meltdown and Spectre are timing attacks. They need access to timers in the environment. Uh, and in this code example, uh, the WebAssembly code has no access to a timer. It can't access uh, any timing functions. So it can't do any reverse engineering of the CPU cache to, to try and discover sensitive information. So, um, this is also uh, a demonstration of Perla. So the, the module only has as much access as it needs to, uh, to do its job. An AST parser doesn't need root access to the file system. Yeah. I don't know anything about WebAssembly. Are you saying WebAssembly doesn't have access to JavaScript buttons like object? So uh, yeah, it, it doesn't have any global object like JavaScript does. Uh, so it won't have access to um, to access any anything like that, and so it can't construct an object and access the uh, dot prototype and look at that. Exactly. Unlike every other programming language that anybody here has probably used much, and, and that's exactly the, the next thing I'm going to get to. So. <laughs> So what about JavaScript? Well, JavaScript has all of these exact same security properties that WebAssembly has. And uh, this is um, what, what we mean when we say it's very close to having these strong security, um, security, uh, uh, lost the word, <laughs> uh, properties. Uh, so um, except for four things. Uh, one, we have global capabilities. We have global dark process. Uh, if we implement fetch like the browser does, we have global.fetch. Uh, we have a mutable global and mutable intrinsic, so you can override object pro uh, prototype. You can add things to the global. You can read sensitive information off the global. Uh, we have access to timers, and we have unrestricted access to imports. Um, 
So I'm just going to go through these in a little bit more detail. Uh, global capabilities of process, you can have a whole bunch of sensitive information on process. Uh, process not environment is probably going to have some security tokens on it. Uh, you can read the standard in. Uh, so these are all things that can contain sensitive private information that you don't want leaking out. And if we have a global fetch, well, uh, in the, so in this example, I've got like a JavaScript uh, parser, and then underneath it can just have a whole bunch of code that steals secrets of the process environment. It can, it, you know, take take all of those from the globals. And if we have a fetch global, it'll be able to share those secrets with a third-party server. Um, and this is uh, one of the arguments for why we probably don't want a fetch global in Node.js. And I would argue strongly against a fetch global in Node.js is because it makes this uh, global capability available to all third-party packages, which if we don't have, uh, then those packages don't have the ability to, to share these secrets anymore. We've also got DL open. You can open any uh, node native binary and get full access to uh, native interfaces. And we've got process.hr time, which is ideal for doing the meltdown spectre type timing attacks because you don't even have to construct a timer anymore to do those attacks. You've got this perfect uh, CPU timer that you can use to detect when it's optimizing. Um, the other thing is that these mutable globals and mutable intrinsics, you could have a, a third party package that overrides JSON.stringify. And now uh, you're using Stringify in your app and it's behaving the same. But in the meantime, it could be stealing all that information that's running through JSON.stringify. So, uh, and then sending it off to, to a third party server. Uh, Object.toString, .prototype.toString can be overridden to do the same thing. It has the this binding. So you suddenly exposed, uh, just by calling two string on an object without realizing it, you've exposed that, that, um, that object itself to some third party code. And so these traps in JavaScript allow third party code to intercept objects that you thought were only within your own application code. And here is an example, another example of um, ways in which you can inject into uh, intrinsics and uh, this one's a little bit more convoluted, um, but say, for example, you have a walk function that has objects of two types, and uh, it's either type A or it's type B, and the one type has a children property and the other type doesn't. And you check which type you've got by checking if, if you can do that property access and if it returns undefined. But that property access to x.children is going to go all the way down the prototype chain of objects. So if some malicious code had defined children on the object prototype, it's got to get a trap. And it can also steal that object. Uh, in this example, uh, the classes, uh, these are not just objects, they're classes. Uh, and you could have potentially um, functions or capabilities on these objects as well that are being um, made available. So it's, it's, these are the ways in which we're spilling uh, these security properties. Any questions on that? So um, there are uh, overall in the context of uh, globals, okay, and intrinsics. Uh, sorry, and uh, primordials, which you haven't talked too much yet, but it's probably relevant. Um, so uh, the way we are tracking primordial primordials in, in Node, it uh, introduces some performance over it. And accessing globals is faster than not accessing globals to some extent, uh, and doing a level of protection overall on accessing those things. Like that's my, my main blocker on, on on your PR is is performance, right? So I, I just want to flag that it's not it's not just about security. It's also about uh, there are also other crossover concerns. So it's 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 a it's a very. Can you clarify what your performance concern is? So um, I I've been recently doing some work on Eventometer, and uh, Eventometer, if you don't know the internals, it uses reflect.apply, and we get that reflect.apply from our primordials blah blah blah, um, that reflect object. However, uh, accessing that object through reflect.apply as we are doing, and moving it instead of doing 
const apply equals reflect.apply in the file, and then just using that instead gives us an 80% performance improvement on our micro batch runs. So, yeah, sorry. I just, so, how, how I'm just flagging it as, as a theme. But how does that relate to uh, this? It relates because you have, you know, the problem with, with the globals and the way you're doing the global stuff. The, the way you want to are you, are you referring to the, the, the PR uh, and the technique I've used in that? Yeah, PR? yeah, yeah. So the, okay. the, the, what I'm referring is on the, if granting security on those type of global things um, needs to not have an impact on the performance of Neo. And this is the two uh, different uh, direction. So to be very clear, uh, global dot process is it. There is nothing else that I'm proposing changing. And that behavior of global dot process does cause, so, so that I've kind of created a PR and saying, well, these globals, uh, it's this example where we've got all these things on process in the global scope. And I'm saying uh, we should deprecate process so we can allow this not to be possible anymore for people to read authentication tokens or process on environments in any JavaScript environment, but we're only deprecating process in ES modules. And the way that I constructed that uh, deprecation was to kind of have a getter for process on the global object. And you're, you're saying that getter itself is a performance degradation for common JS, and we also need to bear that in mind, right? Yeah, that, okay. is, you know, that, that is my, so the, I just wanted to flag it. It's not just about yes. um, uh, security, OK? There is. A, you, you. There are different right. levels of concerns and cross-cutting concerns here. Um, so, shall we come back to that conversation? Yeah, I, I, the other thing I want to say on, on the fetch thing, yes, please, that thing as a global is it's a very bad thing. Okay. Come to the <laughs> fetch session later that we talk well, about. Well, it's actually now. Okay. <laughs> now? We've got uh, 25 minutes. Do we? Yeah, this is an hour. Yeah, oh, you're <coughs> right. I'm sorry. Yeah. Thank you very much. I misread the schedule. All right. So fabulous. We, you have lots of time. Never mind. Yeah, you're <laughs> making me panic there. Uh, right. So what we've got now to mitigate these these problems of the globals and the intrinsics is we have a frozen intrinsics flag that landed in node 11.12. And what this does is it goes through all these objects like JSON, object, object of prototype. Uh, actually, none of these. Um, so mainly the, the intrinsics that are available, anything that's on the global object normally, and it freezes it so that you can't do, if you try to do any of these uh, lines of code, uh, in strict mode, you'll get an error uh, if you try to override these, these defaults. And uh, what, we're, what we're doing is we're, we're seeing if those who are interested in exploring these security properties and want to see if they can enable modular permissions, uh, this is absolutely critical to that, but it's opt-in. So we're not changing the default experience in Node. You can opt into it. And then third-party packages will likely hit cases where there are bugs where it, where it runs up against this flag. Uh, and that's where we want to get feedback on and see how people are using this and uh, potentially uh, get ecosystem PRs that, that fix up any cases where it breaks or if there are problems integrating this, this, ch this change of behavior, which is quite a big change of behavior. So you think back in the day, we had things like the prototype library that was entirely uh, built off the concept of overriding native prototypes uh, in the browser. Uh, it's quite a, quite a big change to, to think of these things as frozen, but this is critical to getting uh, security properties in JavaScript if we want it. And, and let's see how far we can get in executing node modules under this flag. And if anyone is using this or interested in exploring it further, uh, please do chat to me or anyone else involved in this work. Um, uh, the, the code cases there are, are scenarios where setting two string on objects that aren't, uh, that, that don't have it to begin with. And these are sort of the, um, the subtle bugs that, that can happen and then the cases we need to iron out when it happens. Uh, and this, on the one hand, it's, it's regarded as a spec bug that you can't define any of the object methods on an object uh, that has a frozen object prototype and you need to make sure they're defined up front. Um, but it's, 
there, these are the sort of bugs that you hit, but hopefully they're fairly minor because the object doesn't have many properties on its prototype. Uh, the third thing is timers, and unfortunately, we can never deprecate uh, date.now in JavaScript. In Node.js, it's pretty far integrated into the ecosystem. I mean, maybe we could make some progress on that, um, but we just have to accept that we have access to timers, which means we have uh, meltdown and specter attacks. Uh, and uh, so we just have to assume that it will be possible for uh, the sort of reverse engineering attacks, timing attacks on the CPU to take place. And sensitive information in the same process can be read. So if you've got a, a token, a secure token, or a secure information or organizational information that's running in the same application, just like the, the WebAssembly example that I showed at the beginning, uh, if you're in JavaScript, you have to assume that there exists an attack that will be able to discover that information in a module running in the same process. Um, and even though there are hardware mitigations coming through for these attacks, they're, they're a class of attack, and I don't think uh, we can consider them solved in, in any way, shape, or form yet. Um, please update me if I, anyone knows more on that. But yeah. Yes, Michael. Is it a solved problem to prevent it from like, processes? Yes, if you're on separate processes, uh, I, I mean, I'm, I'm sure there's, uh, I'm not, to be honest, I, I don't know if, if they do extend to those attacks. Uh, I mean, <laughs> so they don't. <laughs> we we trust we trust browser security teams, I guess, and they tell us that it's safe to have different processes, so we believe them. Uh, <laughs> like all of JavaScript, like I can't like No, yeah, So if you wrote something, if you wrote something in C. Would you be able to get the context of your JavaScript process of a different JavaScript process? Yeah, different. At least at this point. Okay. Look, let's show up when I get back. Okay, I was going to ask about uh, workers. Can I, can I be fixed uh, in the terms of workers? It wouldn't change my. Like, how the ecosystem works now. Um, if, if workers are running in the same process, then they are also susceptible to the attack. Really. And uh, we are not considering like uh, modular permissions uh, for workers uh, regarding feature time or something like that. Well, right. Uh, as you mentioned, so you cannot. You cannot. Uh, in the case of the Dot now, but you cannot do that. Yeah, maybe, maybe we could add a flag to node to disable date dot now, but I'm not optimistic about that working in the ecosystem. I just think it'll break too much. Already, this um, frozen intrinsics is, is a tough one, and it'll take a lot of collective effort to be able to support the ecosystem and, and PR the ecosystem to support it. Uh, date, date dot now is even more drastic. Uh, but yeah, in, in workers, uh, I'll talk about that. That's one of the reasons why I want to also deprecate global dot process because then you don't have HR time. It's harder to construct a high resolution timer with date dot now, but I believe it is possible. There, there are various um, very subtle techniques. Uh, but yeah, process dot HR time cuts out all the need for that fancy work to try to build set timer timers. Um, so, uh, but the, the the key thing I, I want to mention here is. Just because you can discover a secret doesn't mean you've stolen it. So to, to complete the act of stealing a secret means being able to propagate that information to another server. So you need to have the, the timer capabilities, which maybe let's give up on. <laughs> but then you also need to have the capability to share that secret. So even if you're running code on the same process that in theory could be discovering all your internal authentication codes and things, it only can be considered insecure if it also then is able to share that information with a third party. If that code is in a sandbox where it doesn't have the ability to escape the sandbox, then it can't share the secret. So was the secret really hacked is, is the point. So this is the capability to exfiltrate. Uh, and if we move the, the focus for JavaScript from the capability for timers and accept we've lost that war uh, and rather just move it to, the, to focusing on the capabilities for exfiltration. 
then that, that could be a, a way that we still maintain the strong security models of making sure that secrets can't be stolen. Uh, so this means protecting your side channels. So things like HTTP, uh, fetch, uh, any, any other ability to touch the network to get access to any, any way that you're getting out of that sandbox. And we need to think about that capability as, as in terms of a permission that, that we're managing. Yes. Uh, oh, sorry, I, I died. Yeah, no. Uh, uh, sorry, you, you were waiting a while there. So oh, go, no, go. no, no yeah. worries. Um, so I just uh, so I um, spent time with Atomics and Sherry Buffers, uh, just writing spec tests, and I learned about this concept during that, which I had like zero exposure to, called the monotonic time. And um, you know, <laughs> fascinating. But um, I was just curious if um, so we were able to kind of expose uh, like our um, run to the, like our uh, test execution runtime. Uh, uh, kind of host uh, to use monotonic time to kind of like verify um, that like you know things happen exactly when we expected it to happen. And so I was just curious if there was any way to kind of expose that lower level primitive um, to kind of get around the data now issue. To get around the issues, right? Uh, the date dot now. Um, right. Uh, so um, yeah. So that's the third way to construct a timer is with shared memory. Uh, you can kind of uh, have something that, that runs in a separate thread that's always incrementing a single memory location and, and you can sort of form a, a timing mechanism. Uh, so access to shared memory uh, in WebAssembly and JavaScript should be regarded a, a timer mechanism. Uh, ideally for WebAssembly, if we want to be able to be uh, secure for uh, not, being al not allowing those kind of secret attacks, we would want to restrict access to shared memory and, and treat it as a permission. Um, because we, we, have a, we don't have that timer problem in WebAssembly like we do in JavaScript. Uh, but in JavaScript, because we, we have time, uh, it's there. Uh, unless we can get rid of date.now, um, that, that's, that's it really. Uh, so that the fact that, th that there might be ways for shared memory to construct timers is, uh, yeah, it could be another, another way of, of getting time out of it. So, sure. <laughs> Right. Uh, there are many sources of time. <laughs> yes, James. So um, one of the things that I've, that I've started to look at with specifically with workers, you know, right now they when you spin them up, they're given a full copy of the environment, right? They have access to the process and everything else. Um, I'm looking at the um, basically a lightweight worker that doesn't have that. They can only run the code right. that it's given right at the start. They won't have access to require, won't have access to you know, all these things. It's just here's a bunch of code to write. So hopefully, you know, looking at that, it won't solve the date now issue or you know, the access to the, to the, to the uh, shared array. But hopefully, it will give a little bit more of a sandbox for these things. Definitely. Yeah, I'm, I'm also very hopeful for module workers when we get to that uh, to, to make hopefully be based off a similar model. Um, so yeah, we, we need to have a, a secure, uh, sorry, a clear concept of this capability to extract a secret, to send it back off to a malicious server or something like that. And as long as we can control that access, we can control the, the secret from getting out. Uh, and then the thing you watch out for is what's called covert side channels. So side channels that we didn't even know we were doing. So say, for example, you're rendering some HTML and your HTML renderer gets hacked, and now it's spitting out secret information for the hacker in invisible HTML or something. It's, it's a side channel that you didn't intend to exist that now suddenly exists. But these are the sort of things that we will still re rely on security audits for, but the difference with uh, covert side channels is where they're not expected to be, uh, they can typically be marked as security bugs. But yeah, there's, there's still gonna be vulnerabilities. I'm not saying anything here is, is foolproof. Um, but if we think in, so the fourth thing is you, you, the ways that you get bindings in a, in a module is you've got the global, we've got the intrinsics, uh, we've got the timers, and then um, uh, the, the way that you access the out, outside world at this point is through imports. So if you think of imports as a kind of capability, when you import read file from FS, you're, you're asking for the ability to read files as a capability. You're asking for the permission to read files. And actually, at the resolver level, um, we can have a security model because you could just throw on importing from FS and say, no, you're not allowed to import FS. 
So if we treat imports in JavaScript as capabilities, then we're, we're, we're getting something similar to that WASM security model, where uh, we've now turned modules individually into secure sandboxes. And we can control the network capabilities. We know that secrets can't, organizational secrets can't, even if those packages and modules are completely hacked, they won't necessarily have access to, to these things. So I want to briefly just go through uh, very, very briefly the Dino and WASI security models. Um, in Dino, it does something like this. Uh, you run a, a server, and as soon as you run that server, you get a, a question that says, uh, this uh, app is requesting network access. Do you want to grant it? You've got a few options. And only once you accept that is the, is the server, has it touched the server? And then uh, later on, it requests read access to a file. And uh, you have to grant that read access um, as well. My concern with that is it assumes that the user is around to interact with the, the process. And what if they're not? Is your server just running hanging the whole time? So I'm not so sure about that. Uh, there is another way to grant these permissions on startup through flags, which seems better. But again, this is whole application permissions. Uh, so that's great if you're running an application that you know is just going to take in text and spit out text. Um, but if, as soon as you've got any interesting application, it's probably going to have a lot of permissions. And then you've got that third-party code problem that any third-party code is going to have the same permissions. So any third-party, in this example, if you're running third-party code, it also has the ability to talk to that server. Um, WASI has a, has a really interesting um, capabilities model where when you run the process, you have to specify explicitly which directories are given access. Uh, and once those directories are given access, the idea is that you have these special references that represent those directories. In this example, the um, pwid underscore fd and temp underscore fd, which I think the, the ultimate goal is to treat them like uh, references. So in, in JavaScript, you could think of them like symbols that ideally wouldn't be forgeable. I think right now they actually are forgeable, but I think the plan is for them not to be. And then when you load a file, you say, here's my special symbol for this folder, the temp folder that I got access to. And the only way you can get access to that symbol, well, symbols you can only get access to if you're given the symbol. So if you don't have the symbol, you don't have access. So you can't just forge a string and make it up you have to get access to that symbol, and then you have access to load relative to that folder. So it's really nice because it's this, this model by binding. If you've, got, if you've got access to the binding, or someone else has given you access to the binding, you've got access to the folder. Um, and these are unique and forgeable references. So the, 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 the principles are, um, as, as I said, we're not, I'm not at all suggesting changing the default experience in Node.js, not, not suggesting that we, we change the way we're doing things today not suggesting that Node.js overnight implements a capabilities-based security model. Uh, rather, the question is, uh, we have Node.js as a project. It is the steering force of JavaScript that does not run in the browser, and JavaScript in the browser, for that matter. Uh, can we use our power to try and steer this ecosystem in a beneficial direction? And for those companies, for those organizations that are interested in getting these security properties, which a lot of com companies are interested in, what can we do as a project to help um, start to move in those directions that they can potentially wrap, or instead of having to say, no, it's not secure, we're gonna go off and, and do our own project, uh, like safe or something, uh, you know, what can we do to try and provide those properties through Node itself and, and unblock that work, allow that work to happen on top of Node, not get right into core, but just on top in user land and then just unlock it. Um, well, we can already do import permissions through loaders. Uh, loaders give the ability to hook the resolver, uh, which means you can provide a custom FS instance for every module. Every package can get its own FS with its own scoped permissions. Or we, or we could do something like, like WASI's capability where you're passing in, but that, that's a bit more drastic. Um, but the idea is you could you could wrap these APIs up through a loader in third, in third party, uh, sorry, in user land, and you would be able to get uh, these import based security properties uh, that can restrict permissions. So you could say this package only has permission to um, the network, um, but it doesn't have permission to the file system and it doesn't get FS, and you could just restrict it. And this is a huge wide open space to explore, but if we can 
start exploring it in New Zealand, I think it would be very interesting to see where things can go. Uh, here's a sort of a, a complete bike shed of some ideas. Uh, again, this is literally just like jotting down notes and it's, it's terrible. Uh, but if you can control the imports of a package, so you say the local project can only import uh, FS and some third party package, and it only has read access to the current folder, and a third party package doesn't, is not permitted any imports. And you can probably restrict imports by just saying packages are only allowed to import what they explicitly declared as dependencies in their package JSON. So there's a whole lot of problems to think about this stuff, but I think it would be worthwhile for us to, to think about um, uh, new, new work that can build in, in user land that, that, that attempts this stuff. Have I got a question there? Is there a place where all those ideas are already written down? So people can contribute to it? I don't think so. Oh, yeah. Do you know a place where they are? No, no, oh, I'm asking. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I've seen that a few people have suggested things like this. Uh, so I think someone suggested a package JSON schema for this kind of stuff. Um, but I'm, I'm hoping that we can get places together where we, where we can discuss it, because it's, now is the time to be experimenting so that we can start to um, you know, grow these models out, I think. Is, What's I mean, happening? given that we already have the loader property or argument, there could be an easy open source project that implements Certainly. all these ideas on the user land. And yes. Uh, so the idea is you restrict only imports to maybe what's in the dependencies of the package JSON. So you treat the, the package JSON dependencies as a sort of a, a layer where it says, um, I only import these packages. And then maybe think about what core permissions you have. And then I, I was thinking sort of package management time. So as you install a package, you kind of verify the permissions then as opposed to during runtime like Dino, where you could say, I can see what these packages are depending on. And then you have some kind of policy file that's treated a bit like a lock file, um, where the, you, you, you sort of know what each package is accessing so that if it tries to change its security policy on an up, upgrade path, then you can be prompted for it on, uh, on install and, uh, and then reprompt. And again, these are, there's huge usability spaces here, lots of space to make horrible, complicated things that are a pain to use, but that's why it should be, um, that's why we should be exploring and prototyping and, and seeing what, what ideas we can come up with in these spaces. Um, again, maybe install time is not the right time, but I, I kind of like the idea of install time permissions. Um, I don't know, um, but it, we should be having these discussions. Uh, so to summarize, uh, if we can deprecate Mateo uh, global dot process uh, and do not implement further global capabilities, then if you in your company want security and you can execute under frozen intrinsics and frozen global, if we accept that we've lost the war on timers and just allow people to and just focus on the ability to not get secrets out and assume that people are going to be able to use well found spec to discover them. Uh, then we can play around with um, import and permission models on top of that. And that's, that gives us comprehensive modular security. So that's a complete picture. That's plugging all the leaks. Uh, and, it, and please, if you can see another leak, let me know. But, uh, you know, uh, coming from the direction that Agoric have worked out, that is the, that is the um, that is the complete picture of modular security. So we've, that's what I mean by being very close to these strong security properties. So you can't access anything else outside the module. And then you get uh, package security models. So just as an example of what, what's meant, so how does this mitigate the node module um, security time bomb? Well, if you think right now we have this, every dependency in your app has full access to everything, then we can potentially um, get a model where those, those permissions are reduced. And in this example, the first dependency only has access to fetch, which means, yes, it could possibly uh, steal organizational secrets if it is hacked or any maintainer of that dependency is hacked. Uh, Dep2 no longer has any permissions because it's just like a parser and it doesn't need to access anything. So I don't care if it's hacked. If it gets hacked, it can't damage my, my server, it can't damage my company. Dep3 only has access to read from the local, um, the local folder. So if it gets hacked, yes, it can read sensitive information, but it doesn't have network access or side channel access. So it can't exfiltrate those secrets. So I don't actually care if Dep3 gets hacked. If Dep4 gets hacked, it's got access to fetch and the read. 
So if we, that's, that is a worrying one because it can share organizational secrets and Dev5 has write access, so that can probably become a full root and a full backdoor situation. But we've gone from having five dependencies that, that would immediately get root access if they were hacked to just having one dependency that leads to root access and um, uh, two dependencies that leads to the possible loss of sensitive information. Uh, and that's the idea of a reduced attack surface and mitigating that risk because we've reduced the risk. And it's, it's a lot of work to get a, a small improvement, but the idea is if we can have lots of dependencies looking like dependencies two, dependencies three there, then we can get a very secure application model. And uh, to reiterate what I said from the beginning, which is this is not about adding these kind of features today. It's about saying, let's, uh, let, let's enable these, these things and then experiment in user land and see where we can go without having to say, if you want to secure JavaScript, you've got to fork the ecosystem, you've got to fork the project. Uh, what can we, let's try and experiment on top of Node uh, to do these things and, and work towards it in a long-term future. This is very much many years as opposed to being something that happens immediately. Um, so no longer is every package a target. You've only got a few packages that have high permissions. And the hope is as well that those maintainers know that they're targets so they can be more careful and know that they have a very privileged position. Yes, Spencer. I have possibly another question. Please, please go for it. Uh, no, that, that's it. So the, okay, I'll just do my last slide. And yeah, that's, no, that's that's the discussion. OK. Um, was, was it another type of attack? Yeah. Uh, Rohammer. Rohammer. No, no, not another. I'm not, <laughs> not shareable. I'm just flagging it. There is no. Okay. Um, um, there is my concern here. Is the mic is on? Yeah. Sorry. Uh, my concern here is uh, on, on all of this. First of all, I agree on what you, all what you said. Okay. Uh, minus the fact that if uh, removing, uh, we cannot afford at this point in time to uh, reduce the uh, throughput of node in any form. Uh, and unfortunately, global process sits on several very, very hot paths in both node core and on applications um, via process.next. But we're talking about a, a, a 10%. I mean, do you remember what the numbers were? Yeah, I don't remember, but it's, it's still, it's, this was on a micro benchmark that was just doing process access that did slow down by maybe, I think, a few percent. Uh, yeah, still. It's, it sits, that micro benchmark is there because that is the hottest, that process.nastic is used everywhere. And it's, that it's kind of the problem. It's, that's, I'm, I'm flagging it. I, can, can we come back around? Can I finish my, my last slide first? Thank you. Um, so, um, as I say, this is a space where, in the JavaScript space, uh, we're either going to have to rely on other server-side JavaScript projects spearheading work here, uh, or uh, because the browser won't take the first step, and Node.js has an opportunity here to lead the ecosystem and without fragmenting the ecosystem and, and slowly add on security, potentially. Um, and as I say, We've, we've got frozen intrinsics. Uh, we just need to follow through with uh, some kind of frozen global idea and, and then deprecate global.process, and that is it. That's all I'm asking. So Mateo's argument is exactly everything I'm talking about. <laughs> and if anyone wants to hack on, on loaders that do permissions, uh, I'd be very happy to chat. Um, so then, then anything else you want to talk about? Um, but Mateo, maybe you want to... Uh, so the access, accessing frozen objects, it's, it's, still a, it's still a significant performance seat on, on, on V8 node. So in order for this model to be successful, accessing frozen objects should not have any performance cost. And at this point in time, it's pretty drastic. It's still, it, it, it improved, but it's still there. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's, um, you, the, the, mo the, the model where I want to, to reach is um, uh, not, you know, security should, should not be a thought or should have a minimal impact on override on the, on the, on actual, the actual process. 
on the on the so these are also. hot sim flags. I'm not suggesting making it the default, the, the freezing. Uh, the frozen intrinsics is an hot sim. So if you yeah, want to, I know, I, I know that, but it's it's just that the impact is uh, we need to make it viable for companies to make those defaults. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Access performance uh, for those objects are just being done. Okay, being being work work. okay, that's that's great information. Thank you. <laughs> that is, thank you. That's <laughs> that solves my. That's, this is where we have these discussions. <laughs> yeah, this is uh, 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 this is something that you know that is needed. I'm just like that is needed. It's not just that is that, is that piece. Yeah, uh, accessing for the Let, Let's discuss the performance yeah. of global dot process offline and um, but. I hope that this talk has given you something to think about in terms of the security model that we could enable people to build on top of the node. And uh, I think it's that, that, that point that we're so close to it. And if we just do this one thing, we, we, can, we can open that door to, in 10 years' time, having a project that is permissive and, and has all these nice properties. And it would be very cool if that was a node and not another project. I totally agree with you, minus the fact that we cannot. Like that's a very hot path. So the technical solution is not necessarily what we want to use. We will discuss it further. Yeah. <laughs> Does anyone else want to ask any questions about these models or have any thoughts to add? Michael? I was just wondering, like the the one you're talking about, the deprecation of uh, process. Um, can you make that opt-in as well? It's like if there's an overhead, can you so make it opt-in? What we're targeting here is we want users who are writing Equascript modules in their JS uh, not to assume that the global process is available. So what we're doing is we're making it available, we're, we're making it a getter that gives you a warning that says, please don't use the global dot process. Now if we do anything less than that, people will use it, they will publish it to NPM and it'll be so ingrained they'll never be able to change it. And this is why. Browsers can't adopt any type of security models like this because they have all these globals and these things that cannot be deprecated. And we have an opportunity in the, the switch to Equascript modules where we can specifically deprecate global dot process, which is the only thing we need to remove to, to, get, to get to that kind of space. Um, but let's continue this discussion further. Uh, Jan? Uh, yeah, quick uh, question about the concern by Matteo that this is a super hot tech. Uh, super hot, hot tech. <laughs> <laughs> uh, super hot path because of yeah. next tech, um, which also brings me to: Should next tech be the same kind of capability as having access to the process object? In other words, does this mean that we should, as soon as possible, introduce an alternative API to get next tech? Pres presumably, also one that is not as confusingly named as next tech, which actually does not give callback for the next tech. Right, uh, so you say treat it as a, as a separate API or, or something, and then if we de deprecated that, then we deprecate that hop path or something. Um, I feel like we do need to move fast because we're hoping to unflag ES modules at some point, uh, and we shouldn't assume we can suddenly change core APIs. Um, but uh, there, there's no reason we couldn't consider something like that over the longer term, I guess. Uh, Matteo, did you want to add to that? Or you I'm I'm on board. I you know it's a, it's just a matter of you know pushing the change into the system and stuff like that. But it's 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 definitely possible. It's just it's just a matter of deciding. As I said, it's not I'm not against the deprecation of process. I am I am concerned aware of that is being used. So and the next big part of it. So that's not that's slightly different from. So as I said, I'm. Against a little bit that, that type of solution to some extent, not the actual end result. Um, I forgot to ask for questions from online. Um, I don't know if we have any. Um, let's just see if we've got any questions in the chat. No. no. Um, yeah, I don't see any questions there. So we'll call it there. And thanks, everyone. And please uh, chat further with, with any of us from the modules group or myself about this work if you're interested in discussing it. Thank you.